Hello, Sermon Brainwave listeners and viewers. This is Matt Skinner. I'm inviting you to join Caroline, Joy, and me on a retreat next summer so we can explore together the craft of preaching. The three of us will take to the road to host this preacher's retreat, July 29 through August 2, 2024, at the Ghost Ranch Retreat Center. It's located in the remote and beautiful high desert north of Santa Fe, New Mexico, in the awe-inspiring terrain that Georgia O'Keeffe painted. As we're all together in residence at Ghost Ranch for four nights, our program will include presentations, panel discussions, corporate worship, lectionary-based Bible overviews, small group discussions, and preaching workshop exercises, all designed to enhance your gifts as a biblical preacher. You'll meet colleagues in ministry and feed your soul in a contemplative and sacred landscape. To get more information and to sign up, you can find a link on Working Preacher's homepage, or you can go to ghostranch.org, click on Workshops and Retreats, and type Working Preacher into the search box. The program cost is $350 per person. In addition, Ghost Ranch has different kinds of lodging options available for you to purchase, depending upon what kind of a retreat accommodation you desire. There is a cap on enrollment at 75 participants, and limited scholarship funds are available through Ghost Ranch. So sign up today. I hope you will join us there for this unique opportunity. Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Matt Skinner. And me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Caroline Lewis. This podcast is for the 20th Sunday after Pentecost, which falls on October 15th, 2023. And our texts are the first reading, Isaiah 25, 1 through 9. If you are an alternate first reading or semi-continuous first reader, then you want to read Exodus 32, 1 through 14. Psalm 23, you might have heard of it. <laughs> the epistle text is Philippians 4, 1 through 9, and the gospel reading is a doozy, Matthew 22, 1 through 14. Matthew's version of the parable of the wedding banquet, which also includes somebody who wore the wrong thing. And there's a heart. This is okay. You want to talk about the Mount Rushmore of disturbing parables? This yeah. one's right there next to next to Thomas Jefferson for me on that one. <laughs> yeah, this is. I mean, all the you know, all the way down to the angst about what to wear at a wedding. Uh, <laughs> you didn't know the stakes were so high. The shopping that's necessary. Don't compete with the bride. There's got all kinds of stressful, stressful. Yeah. So. There's that. We should just uh, remind ourselves that this is the third parable, and these this uh, this parable uh, stream of how Jesus has entered into Jerusalem and is really is 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 talking about what the kingdom of God is like, but then also uh, on what authority and what what his authority looks like. Now, and when we move to next week, we're we're shifting gears a little bit in terms of uh, the of the focus and such. So this is our our third banner paragraph or parable um, on the Mount Rushmore of parables that uh, that we are asked to think about. So just just a little reminder of context there. Well, I, I'm I'm going to read this text uh, with as much grace as I possibly can. Um, <laughs> And 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 it's it's a challenge to do that, I, I would say. But I'm I'm just thinking, this king, um, is in the moment of celebration and can't get anybody to join with him in this moment of celebration, in this high moment of celebration. And um, he's made all the preparations that he was supposed to do, um, and and yet he can't get anybody to come and they are mistreating those who are sending out the invitation. And so he, he, he casts the net wide to use that other, he, he um, invites those. And I pause and say, 
those who might not be in his social status, those who might not be able to spend the kind of money you're supposed to spend. Except for, I remember this uh, crazy story that um, I I once heard uh, a Methodist, this is when I was uh, early in my Methodist practices, I heard a Methodist preacher say that uh, he kept invited this woman and her children that, who had been coming to their their uh, food pantry to come and worship with him. You can come and worship with us on Sunday, please. You, you are welcome. And um, finally she said, you know, Pastor, I don't have the clothes to come to service. And Pastor said, you know, we can take care of that. It, don't let that be a hindrance. And so the next time she comes for food, he gives her a bag of clothes for her and the children. And then on Sunday morning, she doesn't come to church. And so when he sees her the next time uh, at, the, at the food pantry, he says, I was really looking for you at church on Sunday. And her response was, oh, pastor, those clothes you gave us were so good. We went over to the Presbyterian church. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Touche. Touche. But I, 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 I resemble I, that remark. <laughs> <laughs> Don't we all? But I, re I, I remember how... On Sunday morning as a child growing up, my grandmother, um, who had a full set of dentures, she would always wear her, the, her dentures when she went to church. The rest of the time, she didn't put those dentures in her mouth, but when she went to church, she had a dress that was the best dress that she would wear for church. So what am, what am I getting at? I think the king was already in a bad mood. <laughs> He'd lost some <laughs> servants. He was trying to celebrate. He couldn't get anybody to celebrate with him. And then this one person who receives this unexpected invitation doesn't even put their dentures in their mouth or <laughs> their best dress on for this occasion. That's the generosity with which I read this flare up of this king. I don't know what you want to do with it, but that's a different context. <laughs> I love all that. That's all great. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> young young suck kim in his commentary is helpful about you know don't push the allegorical dimensions too far and it's this reminder that it'll break down in a hurry if you want to make this real sharp i'm sorry this real sort of kind of precise identification of the king with god in every respect and so right. like what you did joy is kind of point out there's this is a story and it's about human beings who act in certain ways. At the same time, it's obviously a very serious story and Jesus has plenty of serious things to say about judgment and all that. So it's it's the challenge of what's this parable trying to communicate and what is it not trying to communicate and how do I make sure I don't totally mess that up? But um, so, I mean, I'll say one thing as well, the idea, like you said, the, the people who weren't kind of up to the standards of the king, who didn't get the first invitation for whatever reason, maybe they would never be able to repay it or, or who knows. But um, I think we want to avoid treating them as, as plan B. Right. Right. As if God's like, you know, I called the, I called the people who had it all together and they weren't too interested. So I guess now I'm going to go to the, the, the undesirables. And it certainly isn't the Gentiles versus Jews and things like that. I mean, it, cause then you get some real theological problems about what kind of a God are we talking about? So that's, that's worth thinking about too, in terms of how this king's generosity plays out. I mean, the first invitation is deeply generous, right? Yeah. Slaughtered calves. I mean, this is if if Rolf were here, he would say the banquet is always the the image of how wealth gets shared in a community, right? What happens when you've yeah. got so much? You you create a, an occasion for everybody to, to to share in it, and um, so there's a generosity here that's spurned. Which doesn't just mean that the king's jealous, but the generosity spurned, like he said, they kill his servants in the process. Mm. The response is so of the invited people is so abhorrent. It's not just like we don't want your generosity. It's like we don't want your generosity, and and we'll just because we're an R-rated podcast, we could go on, you know. But it's yeah. and so they have to, then you have to think about what does that look like on the level, the spiritual level, Jesus is talking about. I think too the 
the commentary was really helpful, um, particularly in pointing us to that the way in which the the parable concludes mm -hmm. that uh, that few are that many are called but few are chosen, which gets to the you know the guy who didn't show up in the right outfit. Um, but which you know also reminds me of the when Peter puts on clothes to jump into the water uh, in John 21. I mean, so it's just one of those like, what? Uh, but, but that is helpful. Call, you know, that, that sense of, of being called uh, is an invitation, but, but then there's also, as the commentator says, that, that if one does not respond to God's call by doing the will of God, that there, there it is. that that invitation doesn't really matter. You could we can spread that invitation to anybody at any time, you know, as wide as you want. But at the end of the day, uh, that if it's you know not realized in your life, if it's not again going back to some of those Mithean themes of of the fruits of that calling, then you can. You can go around and say all the time, "Well, I've been called. I've been called. I've been called," but it doesn't mean a thing. And so, I think that's a I think that's a helpful entry into this passage as well, especially when we when we use so much in the church that language of call and what does that mean, and and that 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 call puts puts a responsibility and accountability on your heart. You are being called to be a citizen of the kingdom of God. And there's going to be certain ways of, of doing that and being that. And so um, don't accept the call <laughs> thinking you can just rest on that. There is, there's something more in that call. That call has to be followed through in, in who you are and how you are in the world. Embodied in your actions and yeah. life. Yeah. Um, and, and following up on the themes that we've been um, um, lifting up over these last few weeks, um, there is an expectation uh, and there's a challenge here when we have a community or a congregation that wants to say, we're doing these things in the name of God, or we're doing this because God has called us to do these things. And these things that we are doing are not life giving because God's call is always to life. Um, we talked about that in the Exodus passage a few weeks ago. It's, it's, it, these sermons should be continuous in telling the drama of God, where the character yeah. of God is consistent and the character of the people of God is also consistent. Yeah, good. I, I want to ask you too a question, which probably isn't fair because I didn't warn you I was going to do this. But um, Ralph in recent you. in recent years, yeah, in the last couple of generations, there's been a movement in some among some interpreters with a parable like this. We'll see it again with the parable of the talents. I mean, some of these ones where there's somebody's punished by a monarch or a ruler who seems to have a bit of a temper, and that movement has been to make the person punish the hero of the parable as if this is a parable about standing up to an unrighteous tyrant. Hmm. So there are some who in, would interpret this as the guy who's not wearing the wedding clothing is the one true believer in this whole thing because he gets the kingdom and he stands up to. Yeah. The expectation. Bully. Yeah. And I asked this question because none of the three of us went there. Yeah. I, I personally don't think, those work in the context. I get what the interpreters are trying to do, but I'm just kind of curious if you have comments about that strategy. It's trying to take a hard parable and make it a little less hard, but. There, there are two things that come to mind for me. Um, one is the continuity. So if you followed what, um, you know, in this, this particular uh, commentary challenges us on following that direct line, that every time you have a, a, the, the king in a parable, it's God. But if you've done that, and then you take a hard turn to do that, that that's really going to be jarring for your listeners. Um, 
so that that would be one. Just you know, how have you used parables to describe the God, the presence of God, uh, the character of God, and then how are you going to make that turn? But the other thing that comes to me, um, and this has been a sort of how I've been reading some portions of the Old Testament, and that is, right now, I confess, there are some actions that are being taken, there are some comments that are being made, and there are some people that I could name that I really wish there was a judging God that would <laughs> do something about them. Yeah, it's Caroline, and, right? <laughs> if there's anybody, no. If there's anybody that has any um, sympathy of that emotion in me, if they have one person, if they're thinking of one community, if they're thinking of one situation where they'd like to believe that there is some good that would address that horror, I need a passage that says there is a king who will finally say enough is enough. So those are my two responses. It's yeah. a good answer. Can I just take one of, since Joy had two responses, can I just use one of hers? Yeah. <laughs> answer the question. <laughs> I, say, I agree with Joy. Let's talk about the old I agree with Joy. Let's, let's move on to Isaiah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 No, but it's yeah. a, it's a, I think it's a helpful, I mean, it's, a, you know, anytime you're adjudicating those kinds of readings, it, 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 you're always doing that within the context of the larger narrative, right? And does it does it ring true with what has already gone before, mm -hmm. uh, and um, and connect with the larger, you know, themes and such of Matthew? So I think I'm less inclined toward it, mm -hmm. given given what Matthew's already set up. But yeah, I, I worry sometimes it's trying to sanitize a gospel that refuses to be sanitized. And I'm not yeah. saying that Matthew's right and we're wrong. I'm just saying right. that we sometimes try to protect congregations from the Bible's mm. yep. Um, yep. really, yep. really hard passages. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure that serves yep. the Bible or us or our congregations well. But that's a big, we'll have to do another podcast one day on that. But anyway, yeah. sorry to waste time, not waste time. Sorry no, to the, install us. They, they, no, let's put it this way. Thank you for going chasing that rabbit with us. No. Yes. Yeah. I'm all about chasing rabbits. Good rabbit. <laughs> Good rabbit. Squirrels too. <laughs> Isaiah 25. Here's a banquet image for you. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> but it also comes out of this idea of refuge, right? Yeah. The banquet's not just sharing good stuff with other people who, you know, need it or want it, but it's this idea right. of a refuge. Mm -hmm. The shelter. This yeah, is such how a banquet movie. becomes. This is such familiar imagery and powerful witness, you know, the shelter in the storm, a refuge in distress, uh, um, the, 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 the shade from the heat. This is, this is in, in a time or a context where people are experiencing horror, this can be more than just a word of hope. This can be evidence of hospitality that God is. And, and that they can experience the embodiment of God's presence here and now um, and not in some future. I, 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 would, I would begin with that in reading this text. And then the language of, then the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all their faces and, and the disgrace of his people. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think, of course, it expands what the, what the banquet means and mm -hmm. what that, and what that, you know, what does the hospitality of God really entail? It's not in addition to this the lavishness and the provision and the and the celebration. It's this. It's these sort of um, these basic um, basic human needs of of rest and refuge and 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 safety. And so I think it's a. I think it paired with the Matthew text and that larger image, of course, biblical image of the, of the banquet of God as being, uh, as being, you know, God preparing that banquet for us. I mean, it, 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 yeah, that's what it does. It just kind of pushes, pushes that, that image a little bit further to say, uh, you know, it's not just a nice meal, <laughs> 
there's something more going on there. So for us to be like that Methodist pastor in the story that not just want to get credit for feeding the hungry, but actually wants to welcome them into the community. Um, so I didn't just invite you to dinner. I actually want you to join our family. That that is that too I, harsh a word for us to be no. reminded of? Soup kitchens no, are I not enough. <laughs> yeah, I think that's good. And at this point, I would also bring in Psalm twenty three. I mean, if that's the if you're going in that kind of direction, then then and the way in which in Psalm twenty three comes up uh, in the lectionary is so we talk we talk about this often, but it's so interesting because it's what it's paired with and in what you know in what. Uh, liturgical season you mm -hmm. experience it or liturgical event funeral or whatever you're going mm -hmm. to hear different things about this about this psalm and experience it differently so it becomes a moment where a preacher can actually point that out and say okay here's a familiar psalm but now with these images from matthew and isaiah what do you what do you hear and experience in this psalm that you don't that you haven't when it was used at so and so's funeral last week <laughs> or a month ago or or whatever or when you've heard it before in your own life and so I would Caroline, probably just I think, that. sorry no go ahead Caroline, I think the reason that this psalm in particular um, but the psalms are used in these moments of grief as a word of hope is because they were first experienced right. as this type of shelter, this type of shade, this type of hospitality. And uh, so I really, really appreciate that, that, that this might be the opportunity for the pastor to really bring home that this Psalm is actually a reminder in a time of grief of the provisions of God um, that that is just the hospitality of who God is. Exodus. We've Exodus. jumped ahead a lot of chapters. Woo. Moses <laughs> has spent here. so much time on that mountain. Yeah. Yeah. Apparently he was having a great retreat with God and enjoying it. And he forgot about all the people down there trying to wait for the instructions on what they're supposed to do next. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Exactly. Plus that Moses guy, he's got that stick that makes water come out of rocks. Right. So and he probably took it up here. there with him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So there's something, I mean, you know, the commentary made me stop and think about the people here and and why the people are so, well, I might first ask why are they so stupid? Um, but, but again, they don't know this God um, the law is going to be part of how they'll know God. And, but they, um, I, I spoke a couple weeks ago about kind of their own religious trauma, right. Of coming yes. out of like who, if Pharaoh's no longer the God and we've been freed from him, you know, now who, what, where, but there's, there's something that I resonate with here about this need for some kind of an expression of God's presence. I wouldn't make a golden calf personally. It's just not my style but the ways we demand something of God. And I'm not saying this is that Christianity is better than Judaism because of the incarnation. That's not my point, but my point is, man, you need something. You need a reminder. You need a, a, a memorial. You need a thing. You need a book. You need an experience. You need a person. You know, it doesn't have to be something. I'm not I'm a good Presbyterian. I don't want to like have images around, you know, but so there's something about trying to take this idolatrous spectacle and making it a little more familiar that I think is probably a good preaching strategy. Calling yeah, is it? Oh, go ahead. Do I? No, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I, I think tapping into what is the human condition that's being named here? What is the hmm. human, uh, the, the human need here? Uh, it's, it's not, um, yeah, it's not just uh, they're they're doing this because of of something of uh, of an absence, uh, you know, like Moses, but the also the absence of God, and what to what do we resort when we experience that absence, or uh, or when we 
when we are really questioning and wondering about God's presence. And, and so what, what, what become those things that we align ourselves with, um, for that kind of security or for that kind of, uh, reminder of the promise. And so I, I think that's, that's the, that's the, based on what you said, Matt, that's the question homiletically that I would sit with a little bit is, um, which I talk about what we talk about with our students, right? Joy is that, Mm -hmm. that, that a passage, you know, a biblical passage is naming the promises of God, but it's those promises of God are frequently in response to the human, uh, human the human condition, the human reality, and um, and we we shouldn't gloss over those very uh, too quickly because uh, you know lest we think that oh I, I would never you know I would never create a calf or I would never create whatever it is, and yet think about all the idols that we have exactly. uh, and and maybe even naming some of those idols mm-hmm. that have that we have put in place of God's presence. Um, I think that would be really worthwhile. In the ways in which we do that, both religiously and culturally, mm-hmm. because they're, they're, you know, if you think of some of the uh, responses to theater and uh, movies and whatnot, um, there's some idolatry uh, in, in the way we're responding to the way some scenes are being shot or some characters are being chosen. Um, and that can uh, be a display that is just as unchristian as uh, some of the other lack of hospitality that we've talked about. But also, uh, I, I tried to set this up last week in saying, if, if we, because the more we stay in a text, the harder that we can hit uh, our, our, our hit is such a violent word, but the, 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 the closer we can get hone in to the reality of our listeners because we name the reality of the characters in the text and we can call that out. And then we let the Holy Spirit work on the familiarity of what it sounds like you said to me in my own life. And so it makes sense that um, the Israelites who a few passages ago were having forgotten the awesome acts of God and are begging for food. And then a passage after that, God has supplied food and now they're asking for water. And now, after having the um, after having the oppressed hand of Pharaoh on their back every single day, and then having the presence of God walk with them through the plagues, through the Red Sea, up to the uh, to the uh, a- edge of Mount Sinai, and now no Moses and no God. I think we should expect that they're like, okay, we need a sign. Okay. We have just been inundated with signs. The silence is too much for us. And we know how to make signs, symbols, idols. Yeah. Yeah. So I appreciate that graciousness, Caroline. I think, I think we can hit, uh, there I am in that violent language. I think we can hone in on our reality Mm -hmm. if we spend time being real clear about the repetitive nature of, of the uh, Israelites that we read through Exodus. Yep, yep, yep. All right, Philippians. Good. Well, next. and then finally, uh, last but not least, uh, Philippians and our last reading from Philippians. And uh, I would uh, just encourage people, our, our preachers, to read the commentary. I find I found that lifting up some really beautiful, I mean, it's, it's such a beautiful passage. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think too of how uh, I mentioned this when we started Philippians, but how preachers can hear Paul's words to uh, Yudia and Syntyche as as words to them of you know leaders who uh, how to move forward in the community um, and but just um, particularly the unpacking of the Lord is near. Um, I just found really quite beautiful. So those are just just things to connect to. And circling around the whole of what we've been talking about uh, in these last few weeks, this ending here from Philippians basically says, do the things that you've learned. Um, Embody the words. Um, This is actually not just believing in your head, but living out in your lives. And that's so consistent with what we've been saying these last few weeks. 
yeah, it's a great uh, way to end on, <laughs> on verse nine, which this is awesome pastoral advice. Just keep on oh. doing the stuff. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Keep on doing the stuff. Like there's, there's not a need to invent something new here. There's not a need to like, you know, here's here's Pastor Paul's, you know, new five step plan for discipleship, whatever, whatever. You know, it's just keep doing keep doing the stuff, uh, and the God of Peace will be with you. Um, it's yeah, it's just a great letter. How they why didn't you put that at the very beginning? You know, it could have been a shorter letter, <laughs> but. Um, but that's nice. And people need to know who Yodia and Syntyche are if they don't know already. Not They're not the most popular names to give to children these days. <laughs> but, um, and we don't know anything beyond this, except these appear to be two female leaders, not necessarily of factions who aren't getting along. And Paul doesn't say, silence them or throw them out. He says the, the church needs them to be um, united in some way. So uh, that's worth knowing too, because Paul's got a bit of a reputation. I don't know if you two have heard that or not, but <laughs> thanks for reminding me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's what I'm here for. Yeah, and then I think uh, this would one way to use this passage in the larger context, even of the of the worship service, is of course that you know the beautiful line in the piece of you know the peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds. Um, it will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus and uh, and or keep watch or will keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus and there's there's something so just beautiful about that the way in which God's peace works and inviting people to think about think about God's peace in that way as a closing um, for uh, as a blessing or as a dismissal I think would work beautifully. And again, I say, rejoice. <laughs>